Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast, where each episode provides in-depth insights about the long-term value of companies and ideas in our current world. Your host for this podcast is Doug Utberg, the founder and principal consultant for Business of Life, LLC. Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. We have Rocky Lalvani with us, and we are going to be talking about staying focused on the bottom line. Uh, This is in the context of both an executive decision maker and or a founder. And when we say staying focused on the bottom line, you know, we don't mean like evil corporation putting uh, profits above people. Uh, What we're talking about is deciding what your expense structure needs to look like based on your target profits, as opposed to just looking at what's left over after you pay all the bills. Uh, Rocky, introduce yourself. And uh, as, as, all, as usual, don't let me talk too much. <laughs> My name's Rocky Lalvani. I'm a profit first professional. I work with small business owners to help them do just what you talked about. We have a saying, top line is vanity, bottom line is sanity and cash flow is reality. Too often people focus on the top line and the reality is is what you keep is the bottom line. And so I help business owners change that focus. Most of them are not accountants. They don't want to be, they want to go do what they love, but somebody's got to look at the financials and you've got to wear that hat at some point when you're a business owner or an executive. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, completely. Uh, although uh, in uh, in classic contrarian fashion, because uh, I, I should let everybody know that, uh, you know, of course, I have a finance background. So it would be extremely easy for me to agree with absolutely everything Rocky says and have uh, have, no, have have no conflict at all and just have it be a, uh, uh, a conversation of violent agreement. Um, but one of the things that I would think as a potential challenge to that paradigm, and, you know, the context might be different because, but a challenge to that paradigm might be like the net Netflix, uh, Reed Hastings, blitz scaling idea. Uh, so the, the whole idea, and for those who aren't, uh, aren't initiated, the idea of blitz scaling with Reed Hastings was that, uh, so the analysis he did when he started Netflix was that the opportunity was so great and time to market was so important that speed was more important than efficiency. So there are a lot of the, pro- the processes, et cetera, in Netflix that are a big mess and they prioritized going fast. Now, I would argue that the reason they got away with that is because they had an exponential uh, stock price growth, which you can't depend on. Others would say the reason they had a stock uh, exponential stock price growth is because they grew so fast. Uh, but you know whether you know whether the chicken or egg came first, you can't really say. But uh, but anyway, Rocky, I'd like to uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, kind of you know h- how do you kind of accommodate that um, you know Tesla Netflix type of situation uh, into the paradigm. So I think the question you have to ask yourself up front is, can you ever be profitable? So yeah. let's throw another company into the mix. It was called Movie Pass. Are you familiar with them? Nope. I'm guessing they went bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, they went bankrupt. And, and as they were going bankrupt, people were buying it so fast that Robin Hood said no more buying. Like they cut people off. It was so bad. But basically, this was a company that in the movie space, they said, hey, pay us a flat rate for the year and go watch as many movies as you want. So my kids are like, hey, for 100 bucks a year, I can go watch all the movies I want. And their thought and their business model was, hey, if we can control people and send them to the theaters, the theaters will pay us because they make all their money, not on the movie ticket, but on the um, concession stand. Seems reasonable. Seems reasonable. When you look at the business model, they were paying full price for those movie tickets. So my kids paying 10 bucks a month and going to 10 movies a month and they're losing $100 on every subscriber. I don't care how you scale that. It is never going to work. It's a bad business model. If you have a business model that requires a certain amount of overhead and a certain amount of investment to get somewhere, I get it, but you've got to have your numbers clear cut up front and you have to make sure you have a good business model because if you don't, there's a problem. Now, Netflix figured out cheap shipping, right? They ship those discs in literally paper envelopes, which if you think about it, 
That's a little scary because you would think the post office would break them all. But here they didn't. And here they were able to cut their costs down, figure out how to ship them cheap and make the model work. So I think you've got to still look at your numbers and say, is this doable? And know where is your tipping point? And do the math to say, can we, is the, is the tipping point reasonable? And is it doable? And then you have to ask yourself, do I have the cash to get from here to there? Or do I have a good enough story and somebody that's going to go out and spend all their time raising that cash to get me from here to there? Because Well, people have to spend time if you're going to raise money. (laughs) Yes, you do. (laughs) People don't realize raising money is a full-time sales job. Yeah. Yes. And if you've ever watched Shark Tank, right, where do... Where do half of the people fail? They fail when they start getting asked about the numbers and they either don't know them or the sharks go, that's not reasonable at all. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Precisely. Well, you know, or uh, another way that, um, that, that you can very easily run into a problem, you know, when you're going through that growth cycle, uh, you know, is, you know, is if you get to, if you get to a point where say your future profitability looks good, uh, but like, for example, say you're growing rapidly by extending credit. Well, now th- this is in when I was uh, when I was studying at Portland State and we were studying finance, we called this growing broke uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, this is what I think that the, the mattress companies did this uh, for a while. They'd offer like 36 months free financing. I go, OK, well, so if you book a whole bunch of revenue, but you don't get paid for it for three years, you need to be floating a lot of cash. E- you know, you know, e- even if you're showing profits like crazy if you're burning cash, you need to have enough cash to burn through that. Otherwise, you're going to be bankrupt before you ever see any of those profits. Well, and that's where people say, oh, I want to get into Costco. And we've we've actually talked through that same scenario of getting yeah. into Costco, because you, first you have to buy the materials to put yeah. into Costco. Then it's going to take you time to create the product. Then you're going to ship it to Costco. By the time you get paid, from the time you get an order, it might be nine months. But as Costco starts to sell out, they're going to place another order. So now you need another round of funding to handle the second or that third order. And most people don't sit down and figure out, hey, how am I going to pay for this growth? And it is the number one, one of the top reasons companies go bankrupt is they grow too fast. Yeah, they grow too fast. And well, because I think there's a double whammy with Costco. Same thing with Walmart. Uh, Number one is that their contracts are almost certain to have a most favored customer. So whatever price you sell to Costco, you'll be contractually uh, forbidden from selling it any lower to anywhere else. So that puts effectively a floor on how much you can discount. Now, generally speaking, I'm not a fan of discounting as a way to grow profits, uh, but it is a way to rapidly grow a business as if you can discount aggressively. So that puts a floor. Number two is that companies like Costco, Walmart, et cetera, are notorious slow payers. So if you put a contract together that says, okay, net 60 payables, you might get it in 90 days or 120, or they're basically going to pay you whenever they feel like it because they're Costco or Walmart. You know, they know you're not, you know, they have literally all the power. They know you're not going to walk away. Um, and so I think that's, you know, it, I think the cash focus is, uh, is uh, in fact, I would argue the cash is if when if you're talking about growing a business, cash, I think, is actually even more important than profits because there are zero companies that have ever gone out of business because they didn't have profits. Every company that goes out of business is because it doesn't have cash. If you run out of cash, that's the edge of the cliff. You, 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 you can persist without profits if you have cash for quite a while. But without cash, you're done. The goose is cooked. You know, say last rights, it's over. And that's very true. Look at Uber. They still yeah. aren't profitable, are they? But they still yeah. keep going because they have cash. Because they have cash. And you know, for some reason, people are continue, you know, every time that they pitch more stock, people keep buying it. So they raise cash. And, you know, at some point the the clock may run out, but it hasn't yet. And 
And they have a good story and everyone wants to get in, but most small business owners can't raise cash yeah. like that. It is well, not that yeah. easy. <laughs> yeah. And, and let's, uh, so, so now, you know, let's kind of, let, let, let's take this from like a Harvard business review case study kind of down to, uh, down to blue collar nuts and bolts. Um, you know, because the thing is, you know, if you're talking about say somebody who's starting a business, you know, say, you know, if you're an entrepreneur during a startup, or let's say you're a mid-sized company, uh, you, you will most likely not have, you know, either not have the, um, the story, the access to capital or whatever, uh, you know, to do these, uh, you know, these extreme cash burn type of business models. And so if that's the case, then it is, you know, it, it really comes back to, you know, profitability planning, expense planning, cash planning, and then making sure that you have all of those ducks lined up so that you can grow effectively. And you know, at what point you have to stop burning cash in order to, uh, you know, avoid pushing yourself off a cliff, or at least that's the way I see it. Tell me, uh, tell me if there's something I missed or if there's uh, something you want to unpack a little further. No, that is pretty much what it is. And what Profit First does is it creates a cash flow system. That's what it is. It's not an accounting yeah. system or anything else that allows business owners to see their money and what the purpose of their money is mm -hmm. in real time. Because yeah. if you're a small business, by the time you get your QuickBooks answer, like life's gone by, right? It's a rear view mirror. Yeah. That's wonderful. But I, I have to make a decision today going forward. Yeah. And so what Mike did was create a cash flow system that gives the business owner the ability to see where he's at today yeah. and make the wiser choices for tomorrow. And for startups, one of the biggest things we do is we like to take that seed money yeah. and we like to segregate it. Uh -huh. Because when you put everything in one pile, you tend to spend it all. It comes back to Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law is all the resources available to a business, they will use up, whether it be time or money. But when you segregate it, it gives you a much easier way to see how much you truly have. And as you see that, that initial cash start to dwindle down, you yeah. start to think twice about how you're spending it. And you become, we, we tell people you need to, you don't need more resources. You need to be more resourceful, figure out ways to do things for less or without spending money. Just be different. Well, and uh, I actually think of a, uh, you, you kind of remind me of uh, one, one of Dan Kennedy's classic phrases, which is that, uh, you know, if you can't make money uh, without money, you probably won't be very good at making money with money either. <laughs> And, you know, and that's exactly where you're talking about is that, you know, in, instead of you know, looking to fund everything with dollars, uh, you know, figure out how to, you know, you know f figure out how to work around uh, your constraints, because then when you bring in resources, you'll be in a situation where you'll be able to, uh, to deploy them much more efficiently. And that is very, very true. And, and I think, we all need discipline and constraints. Yeah. And, and that's what Profit First does is give you discipline and constraints and yeah. make it easy for you to be able to execute. Yeah, well, and and because, because, uh, yeah, and I, I think, you know, and again, I, I'm going to need to bring some conflict in because, you know, a, po a podcast <laughs> episode where we do nothing but agree is just boring. Um, but, um, you know, but I think that the... Um, the thing that's really important to, to kind of keep in mind, especially because we're like we're talking about, right, the small mid-sized business, you know, either in, in what you call a quote normal business. So like, you know, so that would be maybe like something like a retailer or a manufacturer, right? You know, there's not a, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's not a mythical infinite growth, um, uh, you know, kind of infinite growth cloud out there that you can use to justify, you know, kind of whatever valuation you come up with. It's that, you know, it's a, it's a very well-known business cycle that you're following, um, you know, and, you know, when you're doing something like that, it is just critically important to make sure that you're, you know, that you don't get out over your skis because, you know, if you, know, if you end up getting into too much of a cash crunch, you know, the, the problem that you run into is, once you're out of cash, you have no negotiating leverage. <laughs> you can't walk away from any customers. You can't walk away from any deals. You can't renegotiate contracts. Um, you're, you're needing to go in and you're needing to either sell at a discount to get cash right away, or you are needing to factor out your receivables and, and do, and, uh, and selling them at, out at a discount. Um, you know, but yeah, you're, 
I think the it's just so, so critically important to make sure that you don't run your, I mean, particularly your cash down. But of course, long term profits are what matter long term because over the long term, profits and cash equalize. Over the short term, um, you know, the uh, it's that cash flow that you really have to pay attention to. And I think keeping that real time view is really important uh, because if you don't have that, then it's it's easy to make cash commitments that can back you into a corner. And once you're backed into that corner, it can be really hard to kind of tap dance your way out of it. Um, I, I mean, thought uh, we were going to have conflict. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, yeah, we're going to have to. Uh, okay, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to need to go on some political rant now. So, <laughs> no, here, you know what? Let me just explain how the system works yeah. really quickly. So, we set up bank accounts for everything. Yeah. All right. So it's kind of like the old days, you know, when your grandparents used to get money, they had envelopes and one was for the rent. One was for utilities. One was for food. And when you ran out of money in that envelope, you stopped yeah. spending. Uh, but by the way, my dad still does that. And there you uh, go. When, when, when I took my personal management merit badge in Boy Scouts, that, that, that was the system he taught me. Uh, like, for example, when we go out to lunch on Sundays after church, he has an envelope that he has his cash in and he writes mm-hmm. down <laughs> what, what he spent it on <laughs> and, then, and, and, and then meters out the cash. And then he meters out the cash. So Mike created the same thing for business owners. The one account is your income account. It shows where all the money comes in. And then we set up an account for profit. So we take profit right off the top. We put it in an account. We have an account for your pay because business owners pay themselves last instead of first. And if you're not on solid ground, then again, just like no cash, no business owner with money coming home, Mm -hmm. you're not going to be in your best place. Then we put money aside for taxes And then the last account we put money in is your operating expenses. So you know how much you truly have to spend. Now, people argue with me and they go, why do I need all these bank accounts? This is stupid. I can look at it in my, you know, accounting system. And we're like, no, you can't. You don't. Right. You have to open the bank accounts and people just won't do it. It's mind boggling. Well, and uh, although, wow, one thing that I would challenge you on is that I, I think conceptually, I love this system. Practically, okay, what, what happens when your business, you'll go, okay, I have my revenue, I just did my profit allocation, I just did my, uh, my, my owner payment allocation, uh, I haven't paid my profits or operating expenses and the money's all gone already. Well, no, because it's a percentage. <laughs> we break it out by a percentage. Gotcha. So you have a set percentage. So if $100 comes in and you said you were going to be 10% profitable, well, yeah. then 10% goes to profit. If your cut of the business is, let's say, 15%, 15% goes to you. And then let's say 10% goes to taxes. And then the remaining, I don't know what the math is there, 50, 60% goes into OPEX. And that's where you're operating from. Here's what's happens. And this is what happens really quickly and upfront. They run out of money in their operating expenses faster than they imagine. And the reason they do is because it's not all piled in one big pile. Everything's been allocated and it forces you. It's that gut check. Uh Uh-oh, I didn't sell enough or I spent too much. And it tells you that much sooner than if you have that big pile of money in one place. Yeah, well, and because I think that, uh, you know, what this system ultimately gets to is essentially saying to, it's basically a way of systematically bootstrapping your business uh, on a shoestring until you get to where you have enough revenue base to where you can float an operating expense footprint while paying yourself, paying taxes, et cetera. Uh, yeah, you know, and- am, I, you know, am, I, am I hitting the nail on the head or, is, or, or am I off course a little bit here? No, no, you are. And the cool, I've seen business owners start with this system and they're profitable yeah. from day one because they yeah. built their processes to be profitable from day one and they don't spend their profit on their business without thinking twice because everyone says it's a business expense go ahead and spend it and that's not exactly true right you're in the expense business you understand that just because it's a business expense doesn't mean it's a wise expense yeah well and you know because like for example for the sake of argument let's say that your tax your effective tax rate is 30 percent okay well in that case if something's a business expense what that means is you're spending a 70 cent dollar but 
you know, spending 70 cents instead of a dollar, but you're still spending money. So mm -hmm. if, you know, if it's an expense for your business that you don't really need that, you know, but you're able to spend a cheaper dollar on it, that's not necessarily a wise use of capital. Unless you give it to me, <laughs> then it's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll take your 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 money all the time, and, and yeah. so you can get a tax deduction That's... and feel good. Which yeah, exactly, is the absurdity yeah. of what business owners do. They they do spend money that they shouldn't spend because they don't want to pay taxes. And I hear that all the time. And it's a yeah. horrible way to run your business. Well, and I'm going to date myself here, but I remember back in I think the mid 2000s or so, there was a um, the heavy vehicle tax uh, tax loophole. So there were a bunch of people who went out and bought Hummers, you know, so they dropped like 70 80,000 bucks on a Hummer. And they said, Okay, well, I can write it all off on one year. And I'm like, Okay, well, but write it off of what? You, you need to have revenue in order to be able to write it off. <laughs> and that's the problem though. And I think this is, so think about this. If you have a 10% profit margin yep. and you go buy a $70,000 Hummer, you need to now go out and sell $700,000 in revenue yep. to cover the cost of that Hummer. And that's yes. what most business owners don't realize yep. is how much you actually have to sell to cover that additional dollar in expenses. Yeah, well, and I was going to say because uh, and ten percent is actually a pretty high net profit margin, uh, you know, uh, kind of relative to the full full gambit. I think the, you know, your average corporation has around a five percent profit margin. Uh, you know, you know, now small business would probably, you know, a lot of small businesses or service businesses. If it's a professional services, you have pretty high profit margins just because a lot of your cost is labor, and you know, you don't have as much of those uh, kind of hard variable costs like if you're in manufacturing. But still, the idea is that whatever that margin is you have to sell a multiple of that in order to be able to float that expense otherwise so, you're pushing yourself upside down correct large businesses have such a small margin for a major reason so there's actually a study that comes out of mit yeah. from jonathan burns and basically what he said is if you look at a large corporation 20 to 30 percent of what they sell is highly profitable Yep. 20 to 30 percent of what they sell loses money and the remainder is break even. But nobody in the organization knows where the pools of profit are. And and nobody wants to find out because think of this. I'm a CEO and I go to Wall Street and I go, hey, um, next year we're going to cut sales by 70 percent. But I guarantee you we'll make more profit. I guarantee you that guy will get fired and that stock will tank. So we're not even incentivizing people for the right yeah. things. But the reality is I've seen small business owners cut the amount of work they do mm -hmm. and take home more money. And that at the end of the day is key. Work less, make more. Yeah, well, and because, uh, yeah, because I think one of the things that you're getting to, which is uh, something that's a... Um, you know, that, that I'm really uh, interested and passionate about is appropriately valuing time. Uh, you know, because a lot of people, what they do is they think about money, but they treat their time like it's free or even worse, treat my time like it's free. Um, you, know, you know, time is actually more valuable than money, you know, because like, for example, you know, if I make a bad decision, and I lose $50,000, I can go make another $50,000. Um, you know, today's 24 hours are gone forever, never getting them back, can't be done. Um, and so that because of that, you have to really just understand how important time is and value it uh, accordingly. And I think a lot of people just treat their time like it doesn't have any value. And that's really just not the case. And, and you still have to put a value on your time and also on your employees time, yeah. because, you know, you might have two services and they both sell for one hundred dollars, but one of them requires 10 minutes of your employee's time yeah. and one requires four hours of your employee's time. Well, if you're not understanding that and you're not tracking that, then you're going to be yeah. making your employees do all this work. That's not putting money to your bottom line. And yeah, that's exactly. the problem. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and okay. So, uh, you know, uh, one other question to kind of float your way. Uh, how, how do you, uh, when you're working with people, how do they accommodate something uh, or products or services that have a really long sales cycle? You know, because like most things, business to consumer have a pretty short sales cycle, right? It's like you advertise, people buy it, 
and you know you tend to have a pretty pretty uh, quick cash collection. Uh, whereas you know if you're doing say something like uh, you know consulting or let's say you're selling enterprise you're you're an SAP and you're selling enterprise systems into somebody like Procter and Gamble, the sales cycle for that is measured in months or years. It ta- it's a really 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 long cycle. Um, is it, you know, is this, is this just a more complex version of budgeting? You know, do you really have to say, Hey, we have a long sales cycle, so we need to budget for it up front, or is there some different type of methodology that you use? So what the, I don't usually deal with carp corporations that large, yeah, what gotcha. I, what I tend to deal with is cyclical businesses. Okay. So think about a landscaper, right. Or yep. think about a retailer where, is Christmas time or a landscaper that makes the bulk of his money from March, April through, let's say, September, October, Uh and then has very lean months. What we do is we look at the yearly revenue for that company. So let's say you've got a company with 1.2 million in revenue, but in the summer months, you're doing two, 250,000. What we do is we scrape the excess off the top. So yeah. as soon as the money comes in, if we've got a $250,000 a month, we'll scrape 130000 off and we will put it in a separate account. The sole purpose of that account is to build for winter. Gotcha. And so when, when December comes in and you've got zero revenue, well, I can go pull one hundred and twenty grand out of that account and I can pay my overhead because your overhead doesn't go away, right? Yeah. That truck has still got a payment. You know, you, you still have to pay yourself because you still got to buy Christmas gifts. And so what we do is we get ahead of the curve by putting the money aside to take us through the lean times in cyclical businesses. Gotcha. But yeah, if you've got that big, long sales cycle, you got to figure out how you're going to survive until yeah. that revenue comes in. Yeah, no, I think that's... Uh... Yeah, well, and I think that's, you know, that it, it, I think ultimately it all comes back to planning, uh, you know, which I think is the, is the crux of the conversation. But, uh, you know, but of course, you know, I like to throw a curveball at you here and there. <laughs> uh, so, our, so Rocky's been a great conversation. Uh, tell people where they can uh, connect with you or, uh, you know, subscribe to your le- newsletter or at the very least learn some more. Sure. Before we do that, can, can I ask your guest for a favor? Sure. It, if you like the show Doug is putting on, would you be so nice as to leave him a rating and a review? It really helps him get the word out and gets him to serve more business owners. And at the end of the day, this is what it's all about, right? Serving you guys. So it's a nice way to say thank you to Doug. If you'd like to find me, you can find me. My website is profitcomesfirst.com. And from there, you can find my podcast, which is Profit Answer Man. Or you can book some time with me or, or learn a little bit more about me. And that's the best place to find me. All right. Excellent. Profitcomesfirst.com. That, that sounds great. Well, Rocky, I really appreciate your time today. I appreciate you allowing me to be here with your guests. Thank you so much, Doug. It's been All right, a blast. Awesome. Everybody have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Terminal Value Podcast. Share it with your friends by sending them to TerminalValuePodcast.com. For more information, please visit BusinessOfLifeLLC.com for full access to Doug's products and services. All rights reserved. No part of this broadcast may be produced in any form by any means without written permission from Business of Life LLC. All trademarks and brands referred to herein are the property of their respective owners.